Hey guys, welcome back to Task and Purpose. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. The greatest threat to U.S. naval ships are long-range missiles hitting their hull. China has been investing more heavily in long-range munitions to prevent U.S. ships from continuing to have access near the South China Sea. This has created a need for missile defense systems to counter those new threats. In the past, rockets, mortars, and missile attacks were impossible to counter. You tucked your head between your legs and you prayed you got lucky. Today, the United States military uses the Centurion CRAM, which stands for Counter Rocket Artillery Mortar Initiative. It's actually started its life as an air defense system developed for the Navy. The original system is called the Phalanx CIWS, pronounced CWIS. The CWIS was designed in 1969 and was intended to be the last line of defense against anti-ship missiles, aircraft, and small boats. This is the asset that would give the US military a huge advantage if they ever fought a war against an enemy with artillery. It uses a 20 mm M61 Vulcan Gatling autocannon, which is linked to the KU band control radar. KU band simply means the range of frequencies and a fire control radar is a radar system directly tied to the weapon system. It uses radar to track an object's flight and if it determines that it's going to hit the ship that it's mounted on then it destroys any target that it designates as a threat. When the CRAM detects an incoming projectile it automatically warns the entire base. Incoming, incoming, incoming. Danger Will Robinson. The SeaWiz was designed and manufactured by General Dynamics and went through a low-rate production testing in the 1970s on the USS King, where it was determined to need more improvements. It had a second round of testing where it exceeded the requirements and eventually entered service in 1980. You can think of the Phalanx like the world's most high-stakes goalkeeper. The need for the CRAM came about because of the global war on terror. The US Army requested an anti-projectile system in 2004 in order to protect troops on the ground from rockets, artillery, and mortars. It was rushed into service one year later in 2005. The system is built around the M61 Vulcan Gatling autocannon and weighs around 14,000 pounds. The M61 Vulcan has six independent barrels that fire a 20 by 102 millimeter cartridge at 6,000 rounds per minute although it has a slower rate of fire on the CRAM at around 4,000 rounds per minute, with a muzzle velocity of 3,600 feet per second, an effective firing range of 1,625 yards, and a max range of 6,000 yards. The Vulcan as a Gatling gun traces its roots to 1946, when the US started Project Vulcan. Sounds like a metal album. The Vulcan was designed by General Electric, who sold the license to Martin Martia, who then merged with Lockheed. Later, Lockheed Martin Armament Systems Division was acquired by General Dynamics, who still makes it to this day. This lets them both make the CRAM independently. The Vulcan has been mounted on multiple aircraft, including the F-4 Phantom II, the F-22 Raptor, the F-18 Super Hornet, the AMX, the A-7 Crosshair, and several others. The Vulcan can be cycled hydraulically, electrically, or pneumonically driven. There's a gas-operated version that uses a solenoid to spin up the weapon, and because the Vulcan is a very custom weapon, the feed system differs depending on the use case. That top section part houses the search radar and also the tracking radar components. Apparently it's also perfect for camouflaging as a duck. The enemy won't know what hit them. Quack. Sorry about that. Then directly under the gun barrel you see the ammo storage for about 1500 rounds. And then directly below that is the electronics compartment. The very first Vulcans used a link ammo chain, but problems led to the weapon being upgraded to a linkless fed system. The Vulcan has a total of 39 confirmed aircraft shot down during the Vietnam War. The bolts for the Vulcan cost $27 a pop, which means at 4,000 rounds per minute, it costs about 1,800 bucks to fire the weapon just for one second, which isn't so bad compared to the cost of a Patriot missile system, which is estimated at $3 million per missile. So you don't want to be firing that missile at a $2,000 mortar. I have to admit I wasn't expecting the phalanx to have a rich and deep meme culture online. I see no god up here other than me. Hey little man, how's it going? Incoming, incoming, incoming. <laughs> The Vulcan is the heart of the CRAM. It's very combat proven and troops love it. But the CRAM does not have an IFF or identification friend or foe antenna. Instead, it collects data in real time from the fire control radar system on board. It looks for three different criteria in order to identify a projectile as a threat. First, the radar system determines if a target is approaching the CRAM's area. If it's not approaching the base or the area where the CRAM is located, it looks at the target's heading and determines if it still has enough time in air to change direction and 
head towards the CRAM's area. Then the CRAM determines how fast the target is traveling. If it's traveling too slow or too fast, the CRAM will not engage. Because the CRAM is intended to protect friendly targets, it uses a special strategy to minimize collateral damage. The CRAM fires a bullet that's called the MPTSD, or the Multipurpose Self-Destructing Round. It's a tracer bullet, but it also has a hardened steel body, an incendiary nose, a high explosive core, and a special self-destructing body feature behind the HE core. This thing is a combination of HE, tracer, anti-vehicle, and self-destructing bullet. It's wild, and it's like nothing I've ever heard of before. The fact that the CRAM does not include an IFFF antenna to locate friendly forces is a bit worrying to me. So how does this play out in the real world? Is there anything to worry about here? And didn't I mention some controversy earlier? Well, there are a few major incidents with the Phalanx Seawiz that took place before the Army commissioned the CRAM. There was also a live fire exercise in 1989 where the Seawiz successfully engaged a drone, but as the drone fell, the Seawiz re-engaged and ended up striking the bridge of the USS Iwo Jima, which killed one officer and injured a petty officer. There was also a plane towing a practice target that got shot down in 1996 when the Seawiz targeted the aircraft instead of the target, although the pilot survived. During the first Gulf War in 1991, two Iraqi missiles were fired at some US ships out at sea at the same time. One of the ships fired a chaff countermeasure, which let out a cloud of metal debris. The purpose of the countermeasure is to obscure the ship and confuse the incoming missiles so that they miss. A phalanx Sea Whiz from a different ship targeted this countermeasure and fired on the ship, hitting the USS Missouri but causing no injuries. And a couple of years before that incident, there was a situation where the phalanx had a really unfortunate failure. In May 1987, during the Iran-Iraq War, two missiles struck the USS Stark. The phalanx Sea Whiz did not spin up and 37 sailors were killed with 21 wounded. The specific missiles that were used to fly were flying at about Mach 0.9, meaning that they were subsonic or slower than the speed of sound. So this is the kind of textbook situation that the Sea Whiz was designed for. So why didn't the onboard systems protect the USS Stark? If you go just off speculation, operation of the Phalanx Sea Whiz is dependent on its crew, which requires an intense 10 week course and multiple people to operate. So you can easily imagine how complex the system is to operate and how easy it might be to mess up. But you don't want to rely on speculation, of course. There's a declassified official report on the incident, which was sent to the Secretary of Defense from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and it's detailed the explanation of the events. The USS Stark was in international waters, not a direct threat, and was not antagonizing Iraq. The Combat Information Center knew about the Iraqi fighter jet and kept a constant real-time track of the aircraft, according to the report. The consensus on board was that the Iraqi fighter was most likely benign, I mean, who would want to attack a US Navy frigate unantagonized? But the two missiles that hit the USS Stark had a 38 mile range. So when the fighter changed course directly towards the US frigate, there were two huge factors that would end in tragedy. First, the weapons control officer position was vacant at the time. And second, the fire control technician who was assigned to operate the fire control radar and the Sea Whiz had previously left on personal business. So when the tactical action officer or TAO finally tried to spin up defense, the missiles were already in flight towards the frigate. All of this culminated in the automatic detection tracker not being operative. The stir fire control radar was in standby mode instead of armed, and the M92 fire control radar was in search mode instead of tracking the missiles. So in recent years, the CRAM got a lot of combat time in the global war on terror in Afghanistan and Iraq. So how did it fare in combat? I remember the first time I saw the CRAM deploy, and I think I had the same reaction that these soldiers had. What I've got behind me here is a land-based phalanx weapon system. Very capable system. We borrowed from the Navy. Same system the Navy uses in on its vessels to protect uh, themselves from uh, missiles, boats, and aircraft. I think it's important to explain how the CRAM stacks up in the US military's lineup of air defense options. The United States Army Air Defense uses an array of ground-launched surface-to-air defense systems and a number of airplane-mounted air-to-air missiles. Systems like the Patriot Missile System cover long-range, fast-flying missiles, like intercontinental ballistic missiles at heights of up to 40,000 kilometers. And then there are some systems designed to take down lower-flying threats like UAVs, helicopters, and jets, and cruise missiles. 
Examples of this include the Stinger, the Avenger, the Amshorad, and a few others. There's a bit of an overlap in these systems, but there's a couple of specific threats they don't cover. The CRAM is geared for mortars, artillery, and artillery missions like the Kasua. And while the CRAM does do this job fairly well, it's a difficult task to be perfect at. Because we've had 20 years of war in the Middle East, there is an absolute ton of footage of the CRAMs firing up and destroying mortars and rockets but it doesn't usually defeat every single one. I found a number online, and while I was unable to corroborate it, it claimed that the CRAM defeated around 70 to 80% of munitions fired in its vicinity in Iraq of 2006. The biggest downside of the CRAM is not its accuracy necessarily though. The combination of the CRAM's short range and how much each one costs limits how effective the system is. With an effective range of only about a mile, you would need to have a CRAM in every base that you have troops on, and you would have to place more than one CRAM on the large airfield. So let's do some basic math that won't even hurt my brain. At the height of the Iraq war, there was about 505 US bases in Iraq with a cost of about 10 to 15 million dollars per unit. Let's use the more conservative 10 million number here. If you wanted to place one CRAM in every coalition base in Iraq in 2007, it would cost 5.5 billion dollars. To put that into perspective, in Iraq at the same time, over 50% of military casualties were from IEDs. This led the army to putting $45 billion into the MRAP program, which helps defend troops from mines and IEDs. And while indirect fire from mortars, rockets, and artillery did in fact present a significant threat, I think the US military put the most money into defeating the most significant threat. Hey Spare Parts Army, thank you so much for watching. If you found this video valuable in any way, hopefully I earned your like and subscription. Also, I wanna give a big shout out to our associate producer, Andrew Tucker, who did an amazing job researching, writing, and helping produce this episode.